We're going live and this Hangout on Air is definitely live and I'm with Mark Billinghurst and as I was just explaining, Mark, thank you. I'm very appreciative of you, Professor Mark Billinghurst, uh, um, attending what I'm calling as the glass interviews for want of a better term. Uh, I'm actually sitting in the Australian National University and this is my office here, but as you can see on the lower third explanation there, I'm, I'm also a professional associate at the University of Canberra. Uh, under the supervision of uh, Professor Robert Fitzgerald and as the Inspire team has always been, we're very interested in um, where technologies are and where we're heading and uh, this, this uh, interview serves as part of that discussion but more broadly we're also uh, segueing or connecting this into the uh, Google Glass Explorer team in uh, the United States and elsewhere across the world. In fact, I was talking with Germano Tellis yesterday from uh, Glass uh, Society of Glass in Brazil. So oh. perhaps, Mark, for the audience who don't know who you are, could you perhaps introduce yourself, uh, please? Sure. So I'm, I'm Mark Billinghurst. I'm the director of the Hit Lab New Zealand at the University of Canterbury. And I lead a research institute here that does a lot of work on augmented uh, reality and wearable computing. And I've been working in that space since about the mid-1990s. Uh, um, and we've, we've got some Google Glass displays here and we've been using them in a number of projects um, as well. Just to remind myself, thank you, Mark. Turn this phone off as well. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> that was everybody ringing in. Um, I prepared a series of questions for you and presented them to you and upon reflection when I looked at those last night I thought that for the audience's uh, context that I would um, ensure that they knew that I had had previous contact with you Mark in the past uh, in a number of different ways principally from ISMA but we'll get to that. So I presented these as just as backbone questions and we may go elsewhere with them um, as we could work through them. So, Mark, I have you down in my G plus circles as being a colleague. I have a, a ring that says colleagues. And I said, and within that I note that you have 290 followers. Now, Mark, I'm very keen to know how have you managed to keep such a quiet profile amongst what I consider to be some very incredible achievements? No, oh, well, thanks for the compliment. Um, I guess mo mostly because I do a lot of my social networking either through LinkedIn or through uh, Facebook rather than um, uh, Google or G+. Um, I'm doing more on that though and um, I expect the number of followers will start increasing over the next um, few months, um, especially as we, we're, gonna, we're starting to explore how Glass can be used for a number of um, social networking or collaborative applications and of course that all connects back through your um, Gmail and your G Plus account so you'll be seeing a lot more activity from me on G Plus in the next um, few months. Excellent. And of course as you understand I'm interested in the social sciences and what occurs within social circles so that perhaps explains for a few people why you uh, have remain, remained elusive from some, so some circles but not others. Maybe. So, yeah. um, in saying that, though, I I also note that you claim not to be a glass explorer, or at least not part of that online community. But really, Mark, I'm interested in what do you call your developments with glass, or at least with the wider subsets of alternative providers? Because I'm sure you're not just concentrating your development or research uh, activities with just glass. No, so we're not, um, at the Hit Lab here, we're not far, part of the official Explorers program, but I was very lucky in order uh, to spend five months working inside Google last year um, as part of the Glass research team. Mm -hmm. And so when I left Google, they gave me some devices to take with me. Um, and so we we're able to keep on doing uh, research, even though we're not part of the official uh, program. And so that means that we can do research in a wide range of areas. Uh, so right now, for example, we're looking at how you can use Glass to uh, support new types of collaborative applications or facilitate new types of capture of um, body uh, sensing uh, data. So mm -hmm. even though we're not part of the program, um, we're very much interested in developing uh, research that will contribute back out. And we're also trying to contribute back to the Explorer program in that, um, for example, most recently we just completed the course on programming for Google Glass, providing a course, and in the next week or so we'll, we'll be providing uh, slides and content from that back out on the web into the, um, the Glass Explorer program and other venues as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Mark, um, it may not be apparent to some, but we did meet fleetingly at Ismar 13, which was in your sunny city of Adelaide, South Australia, a beautiful part of the world. Um, shortly after that event, another occurred in the very same university uh, with Professor Andrew Goldsmith, who is well known within the cyber crimes and uh, cyber terrorism environment. Um, what do you see, this is from your perspective, what do you see as the nexus between augmented reality and perhaps that of unmanned aerial systems, uh, UAS, or more popularly known as drones? Well, I think um, uh, augmented reality gives you the ability to, of course, overlay digital information onto the real world. And with drones, uh, in many cases, the people flying them, uh, if they're being flown by real uh, people, are, of course, sit at hundreds or thousands of kilometers away and typically have cameras or sensor data from the drone to help them flying with it. So um, there's a very natural match to use augmented reality on top of the uh, drone sensor data to provide you with um, enhanced information or support the flying or the interaction um, with the drone. So, of course, it's very, very easy to take a live video feed from a drone and put on top of that height information, uh, direction information, um, other information about the sensors on the drone, and allow the person who's sitting um, thousands of kilometers remotely to get the feeling that they're actually sitting in the cockpit of the drone and flying it right there and then. So mm, that's not a project, that, that, that isn't an area that we're directly doing research on here at the HIT Lab in New Zealand, but I'm aware of other people working in that space. And, and there's been a lot of very amazing augmented reality interfaces developed to help people um, control drones uh, much more effectively. Mm, mm. So a very real and tangible connection between one what would otherwise seem as a uh, other robotic environment, but in this case connected via AR. Definitely. Um, Mark, in 2006, which seems like an awful long time ago, I travelled to your fair city um, of Christchurch, which was, <laughs> which again is an amazing part of the world, and uh, Wellington and 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 uh, and um, uh, a number of other locations at the time, with a range of educational uh, networked um, learning leaders who were very interested in at that time in MOOCs, believe it or not. So mm. here we are, you know, a fair while on, and um, I understand that you've just returned from Israel now. What do you consider to be, then be the, he the hotbeds of technology in, or, you know, in the world at present? Is Israel one of those? Israel, very much so. When I was there, um, I attended a very interesting presentation by somebody who was involved in the venture capital or the startup uh, community, and he pointed out that the amount of uh, R&D and uh, the amount of venture capital money raised in Israel was um, the, it made it the third largest market in the world after the US and then uh, Europe and then, then Israel. So there were more, there's more venture capital money put into Israel than was into all of China, for example, or, or India. So um, in Israel, so Israel is definitely one of the hotbeds of technology development. There are lots of startups, companies there, there are a lot of very educated people, they're very technology savvy, and you've seen a number of startups that have um, come out of that that have been acquired, like PrimeSense and, and others. Of course, mm -hmm. Silicon Valley in the US is another uh, hotbed of technology uh, development. Um, in fact, you can't really consider the US as one um, technology location. You have to look across the US and find very distinct regions. So, you know, Silicon Valley, of course, um, Seattle, um, you know, Austin, Texas, and other individual city locations are all um, have very vibrant technology um, environments. Uh, Singapore, I've spent time in Singapore as well, and that's also a, a location where there's a lot of happening in the technology space. Uh, there's a lot of investment from uh, in government in Singapore into uh, technology uh, development there. And then you've got kind of, uh, cities like uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai in, um, in, in China as well. So it's very exciting to see all these different developments happening all across the world. And of course with the modern um, internet and with things like Google Hangouts, you can make sure you're globally connected to all of these uh, activities regardless of where you live. Mm -hmm. And Singapore being a, a major route or major stop-off station for many people going from Australasia or coming back. Uh, definitely. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a hub. I mean, it's, it's the kind of where the east uh, west meets west, really. So it's um, really um, 
in, in, in the same way that the, the major, major shipping companies um, use Singapore as a hub, now you've got major technology companies, we've got large companies like IBM and HP that put technology hubs there and use that as a gateway into um, Asian activities. Mm -hmm. Mark, speaking about activity and humans and uh, how people interact over time, particularly in a personal versus professional context, very interested in knowing uh, from your perspective what the term privacy means to you. Oh, that's a good question. I think that's evolved a lot in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. I mean, of course, 30 or 40 years ago when you wanted to have uh, privacy, then you would um, you know, just shut yourself in your house and, and people outside would be very difficult to find out uh, about your or what you're doing. And now um, it seems like our lives are becoming more and more uh, transparent. So it seems like uh, privacy is, um, I would say, it's really an evolving, um, rapidly evolving concept. What I would have considered to be private uh, 20 years ago, you know, photographs of me on the beach or other things like that, now is, um, you know, I wouldn't consider that necessarily to be private information anymore because of our ability to be globally connected and connected to um, um, each other. I think privacy really is... Um, on an individual level, more for me personally, um, it's about the only thing which I can keep private now is you know my own thoughts and um, um, my own opinions about things. Sometimes um, my uh, online activity is undoubtedly public. Um, a lot of my um, financial information, my employment information, all of those different things are public now as well. So uh, privacy to me has become everything I can keep inside my head and everything that's out in the digital domain is uh, I consider to be public knowledge or available to the public or um, or governments of one type or other. Mm. And as certain, certain AI technologies um, emerge, perhaps those private thoughts or at least some of the physical reactions we have towards things in the environment may give us away, so to speak. Uh, they, could, they could indeed do that, that's right, definitely, yeah. Mark, um, in a world of big data, uh, open data, and uh, the ripples that are still subsiding from the NSA and, Snow and the Snowden case, um, what do you see as the greatest challenge for those who chose to route or choose to route their quantified selves uh, in other countries, you know, the cloud, so to speak? I mean, is wearable technology responsible in some way for a shift in humanity? Oh, I definitely think it is. I, I think. Um of course, um, the Snowden case has brought to light um, just how pervasive um, or how capable the US government has been to um, tap into a variety of networks. And I dare say, you know, what the US is doing is just what China does to their own people and what other countries are doing to their own people um, as, as well. So um, it, it means that, you know, we shouldn't necessarily have any expectation that whatever information put up on, into the cloud is going to remain um, personal or private information, mm -hmm. um, uh, despite what some of the, um, the cloud providers um, show. In, in the context of wearable technology, it, it means um, we've got the ability, more ability than ever before, to uh, capture information about individual people, what activities they're doing, and perhaps more importantly, the context of those activities, and then, of course, um, share that information on a, on a um, global uh, scale. So I think this is going to change a lot with uh, how uh, humans interact with each other. And we've already seen, started seeing some of those changes um, uh, in uh, context of how we interact with, with each other, you know, um, even without uh, wearable uh, technology. So, if, of course, Facebook has changed dramatically how we engage with people. Um, mobile phones have changed dramatically how we engage with people. So the next generation, uh, you know, the Google Glass generation or other people wearing head-mounted or wearable computers um, will similarly evolve into a very different style of interaction than what we've had over the last 10 or 20 years. Mm. And given that you've been in this for 20 years, you would certainly have seen and are part of the integral uh, fabric of that um, that trajectory. So, um, on another note, I you know I pick up sort of things across the web, and occasionally I come across things that you're involved with, like this hashtag I'm seeing bandied around called the Glass Room. Now, can you tell us who takes your C22 
the glass class designing wearable interfaces and why? What sort of people are taking and rolling in your course and why are they doing that? Why are they so interested in it? Sure. Um, so that that course is an out uh, a successor course to one we've just finished here at the university, and um, w that course was uh, designed for uh, professionals. It was a week long class that we taught, intensive class uh, that allowed people to get hands on experience with the class and also to be able to get them to uh, build their own applications in, in that week. Um, mm. But the course you're referring to is, is a, a shorter version that we're going to be teaching at the uh, CHI conference, which is the leading um, HCI conference in Toronto in about a month's time, and then a bit later on at the um, AWE conference in Santa Clara, and then there will be other versions of it as well. And that, that class is really designed for people that want to be able to rapidly prototype um, applications for Google Glass or other wearable computers who may not necessarily have uh, programming experience, but they have some really good design ideas. And so in that class, we're going to be teaching how you can use some easy to use design tools to rapidly prototype uh, for Glass and for other wearable devices, and then test um, the apps you build on Glass um, itself. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems in the past with devices like Google Glass or other wearable systems is that previously has taken quite a high level of technical uh, knowledge to be able to program an application uh, for them. So for Glass, you have to be a very proficient um, Android programmer, or um, you know, for other wearables, to other development platforms. So with the tool, some of the tools we're going to talk about, we'll show you how to build uh, applications uh, with tools as simple as using the equivalent of PowerPoint uh, for Glass. So it's really a course designed to enable many more people to start brainstorming and thinking about Glass applications. Mm -hmm. So it's a very wide-ranging body of people who don't necessarily have to be fully proficient as a developer. No, the and with all the material we're going to be presenting, we'll also be putting it all on the web as well. So if there's some of your viewers that are interested in that content, um, if they get mm -hmm. in touch with me or just uh, Google for it, they'll find all of the course material up on the web so that they can um, do the development themselves as well. Perhaps we could link it to this particular video as quite a number of people will view this post. Oh, oh yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, great. Um, Mark, it's... It's a pleasure speaking with you, and in the past uh, past year, I hosted with my, my supervisor from the University of Wollongong, uh, Associate Professor Katina Michael, the IEEE ISTAS 13 event uh, at Toronto University, along with Professor Steve Mann, mm. and many, many other people who are involved in this area. Um, Thad, I take it you're familiar with Thad Star because you would have come in contact with him through the, uh, the glass. Oh, yes. I've, um, I've, I mean, I've, I know him personally. I've met him several times, and um, we have done some research together in the early days of wearable computing um, 15 years or so ago. So, yeah, I know, I know that very well. So that's going back to the perceptual computing group. Would that be right? Yes, when he was at the MIT Media Lab. Um, MIT Lab. And then, yeah. mm -hmm. So it appears from my research on you both that the term empathetic seems to appear in both of your contemporary current discourses. Can you tell us a bit more about what you mean by the term, you know, by using augmented reality to create empathetic experiences? Sure. So there's been a, in the last uh, eight or nine years has been um, uh, emerging research and looking at how computers can understand and recognise. Emotion. So, uh, Professor Rosalind Picard at the MIT Media Lab and other people around the world have developed some quite amazing systems that will recognize when you're under stress or when you're feeling happy or uh, um, angry and, and so forth. And, and so, in, in some ways, that allows computers to um, show empathy to you because when you exhibit those emotions, then the computer can respond in a, in a certain way. Um, although, what I'm interested in, though, is a slight variant of that. What I'm interested in is actually using computers to mediate communication with other people and help the computer and, and for the computer to help you better understand somebody else's situation. So instead of the computer just recognizing your emotion, it's more about helping convey your emotion to somebody else. So mm -hmm. technology like uh, glass and augmented reality can help with that. One example is that with, with glass, you know, with hangouts on glass, you can uh, see the viewpoint or the perspective of somebody else. So unlike using a Skype call on a desktop computer or a Hangout call on a desktop computer, where you see somebody's face with, with glass, you see from the perspective of the head-worn camera. So you see what they're doing, what activities they're involved in. 
So once you can see what somebody's doing, then you might be able to use augmented reality to um, place objects in their view that will help them achieve a certain task. Or you may be able to um, use sensors on the body to convey back to the person who's, who's watching me um, what my emotional state is and, and help them better understand the situation I'm in. So when I'm talking about empathetic computing, I'm often talking about uh, computing uh, technology that allows you to feel what somebody else is feeling or understand what somebody else is, is, is seeing. Mm -hmm. From that first person perspective. That's right, definitely. Now, Mark, I'm very interested also, I'm sure a lot of people are, uh, these are a little um, future facing, but do you think that perhaps artificial intelligence uh, is set to leapfrog wearables as the next revolution, or do we have to wait and see glass and similar technologies wearables sort of roll out first? Do you think AI is integral or already part of uh, these wearable technologies that we're looking at now? Well, I think artificial intelligence is, uh, as a field, uh, refers to many different techniques that's used to, to um, provide uh, computing with some intelligent capabilities. And, and it may be that some of those techniques could be delivered on glass, and it may be that some of those techniques would use sensor data from, from glass. So I don't necessarily think it's going to leapfrog. I think that wearable computing and artificial intelligence can work hand in hand to create mm. some quite unique experiences. So for example, one of the research projects we've been doing uh, in the past uh, year or so was working on connecting up augmented reality to intelligent artificial intelligence to provide a more intelligent tutoring and training environment. So with, with wearable devices, augmented reality has been using a lot in the past in terms of um, providing uh, cues to help people perform tasks in the real world or help people train in the real world. But in many cases, those applications have been quite uh, dumb in that they will provide just a checklist of tasks to do. They won't provide necessarily any um, uh, just the learning material depending upon your style of learning or they won't respond to your actions um, automatically. So when you combine augmented reality and artificial intelligence together, you can build an intelligent learning environment that adapts to the style of learning that you want or that automatically monitors your behavior and provides learning material when it's required, not all the time. So in the same way, once you take a, a, object, a device like your glass and you combine it with intelligent, artificial intelligence, you'll be able to enable a whole new uh, um, area of applications you haven't had access to before. Mm -hmm. and perhaps the collapse of a number of, at this point in time, uh, separate uh, providers such as Indiraxon and Glass, they may converge and, and so on. Maybe, we'll uh, see. Yeah, we'll soon see. Um, I, this is the core question uh, for, for all the, the questions that I've asked today, Mark, and it's probably the one that's burning on most people, in most people's minds at present. And I'm having a huge backlash already from a number of uh, familiar networks I already have who feel that my focus on looking at head-worn, body-worn, or other wearable technologies as being a little far out there, is or will glass um, cause revolt? Or will it upturn apple cart, so to speak, challenge stereotypes, or is it just going to ubiquitously slip amongst all the tools of, say, for instance, a K-2 to educator? Now, I have a series of, a series of examples from the United States where K-2 to educators are wearing glass for long periods of time amongst their, um, their cohort with the permission of, their, of the families and parents. And my, the subset question to that is, what are the key challenges that we face as humanity with glass? Or is this set to be just a US-based phenomenon and it'll go away like Google Buzz or Google Wave? Hmm. Well, I don't think, um, well, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen to glass long term. I think uh, certainly the wearable uh, technology in general is around here to stay. Whether or not uh, Google stays in the field and, and keeps on pushing glass or not, that's entirely up to them. Mm -hmm. But there are a number of competitors now uh, emerging, and so it's clear that uh, there will be um, a number of companies bringing technology to market. And I think what Google's done is a great job in uh, spurring the market on and, and help creating the market. I, I think there's a lot of uh, social challenges that will need to be overcome in terms of market acceptance. There's still um, some negative feedback about people wearing glass or other wearable computers in public settings. 
And so uh, I think that's one of the larger challenges, not so much a technology challenge, but a social challenge. I think that there's some immediate niche markets that will be right for Google Glass applications right now. You know, we're seeing in the HitLab here a lot of interest from in people in medicine, in uh, application areas like firefighting, in police, um, nursing, emergency response. Wherever people want to have hands-free access to information all the time, um, there's a demand for a device like Glass, you know, high-performance high athletes, things like that. So I can certainly see there's going to be a number of very profitable niche markets that will be growing. And then the, the question mark in my mind is whether or not that will expand out to general consumer use or not. Um, it, it may be that um, we look at uh, four or five years' worth of use in niche markets, and then uh, after uh, some of the social factors and, and form factors of, of glass and other wearables that have been overcome, then you will see an expansion of use into general consumer markets. Or it may take longer, I'm not sure. Mm. But certainly, I think it's the social factors that are one of the main um, challenges that uh, are, fake, are fa faced uh, with glass. But I definitely see that glass will cause um, a revolution in, so in, in how some people work. So already I've been tracking on the web uh, what's ha been happening with policemen wearing cameras, and, and they've been noticing that in the, um, the US, as policemen start wearing more cameras, then the amount of um, lawsuits against the police, the amount of police brutality uh, decreases quite substantially. And so I can imagine that when we bring devices like glass into the police area or into maintenance workers or firefighting, then um, you'll get a dramatic change or an efficiency in how people perform their tasks. And it'll, in those areas, definitely will create a revolution in, in how work is being done. And commensurately, do you think that institutions and educational organisations that support the activities of skills and knowledge uh, uh, being imparted, do you think that they'll change along with uh, that revolution? Oh, well, definitely. I mean, I think we've already seen in, um, in New Zealand, at least, in wide uh, levels of education, how having children in the classroom with access to uh, iPads or tablets have changed quite a lot how education is provided to the children. And um, I can imagine once the devices become cheap enough to be used in a variety of educational settings, then you'll start seeing um, them being used to transform education. Already I've seen several examples of glass being used in medical education where a doctor is performing a surgery and it's being streamed back to remote uh, students that are able to watch the surgery and be observers. And of course that's very different from K2 education, but I could imagine over time similar capabilities will filter down to the lower ed educational levels as well. Mm -hmm. And we're always um um, careful about how far we can predict ahead, or, or that that vision that we might see ahead of us for the for the, um, the want of not causing fear. Mark, it's been a pleasure talking with you about um, your um, part in this whole picture. Um, uh, it's it's been inspirational talking with you about the way that you've approached this as, as a as a higher education. Um, a professor yourself, and I look forward to in the future um, other people's um, feedback on what you're speaking to in this in this interview, and perhaps even some connections between the Inspire Centre Canberra and your own hit lab there in Christchurch, that beautiful part of the world. Hmm, definitely. Well, thanks, Alex. It's been a pleasure talking to you too, and hopefully um, some of the things that I've talked about will be of interest to your listeners and also enable connections to be made between what they're interested in doing and what we're doing here at the Hit Lab um, New Zealand. And of course, we'd love to be able to work with you in the Expire Centre. That'd be really great. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mark.